Hello again. So I am going to carry on reading from The Hidden Life of Trees by Peter Wolleben. We are at chapter 30 and uh, the title is Tough Customers. And so I'm just going to jump right in. I'm going to try and do this all in one go. <laughs> and uh, yeah. So why do trees live so long? After all, they could grow just like wildflowers, grow like gangbusters for the summer, bloom, set seed, and then return to hummus. That would have one definite advantage. Every new generation brings with it the opportunity for genetic modifications. These mutations are most likely to occur during mating and fertilization, and in a world that is constantly changing, adaptation is necessary for survival. For example, mice produce a new generation every few weeks. Flies are a lot quicker. Every time hereditary traits are passed down, genes can be damaged, and with a stroke of luck, this damage will introduce a particularly beneficial new characteristic. In short, this is what we call evolution. It helps organisms adapt to changing environmental conditions and therefore guarantees the survival of each species. The shorter the interval before the next generation, the more quickly animals and plants can adapt. Trees seem completely uninterested in this scientifically established imperative. They simply live to be ancient. On average, many hundreds, but sometimes even thousands, of years old. Of course, they propagate at least every five years, but this doesn't usually produce a completely new generation of trees. What use is it if a tree produces hundreds of thousands of offspring if they cannot find any vacant spots to fill? As long as their mothers are capturing all the light, nothing much happens at their feet, as I've already explained. Even if the young trees exhibit brilliant new traits, they must often wait centuries before they can bloom themselves and pass these genes along. Quite simply, everything moves along very slowly and you might expect this to put trees in an almost impossible situation. If we look back to recent climate history, it is characterized by abrupt changes. A large construction site near Zurich shows just how abrupt. Workers here came across a relatively fresh tree stumps, which at first they set aside without paying them any attention. A researcher found them, took samples and investigated their age. The result? The stumps came from pines that were growing there almost 14,000 years ago. Even more amazing, though, were the fluctuations in temperature at that time. In less than 30 years, the temperature dropped as much as 42 degrees Fahrenheit, only to finally rise again by about the same amount. This, that corresponds to the current worst-case climate change scenario we could ever, ever potentially face by the end of the 21st century. Even in the last century in Europe, with the bitterly cold 1940s, the record drought in the 1970s and the way too warm 1990s was very hard on nature. Trees employ two strategies to stoically endure these changes. Behavior and genetic variability. Trees exhibit great tolerance for variations in climate. And so the native European beech grows from Sicily to southern Sweden. Apart from the capital S at the beginning of the place names, these regions have little in common. Birches, pines and oaks are also very flexible. But this is not enough to satisfy everything they need to do. When temperatures and rainfall fluctuate, many animals and fungi fungi <laughs> move from south to north and vice versa. That means the trees must also be able to adapt to unfamiliar pests. The climate change can also change so severely that it falls outside the range that trees can tolerate. And because they have no legs to carry them away and nowhere to turn for help, 
they have no they have to adapt so that they can deal with the situation themselves the first opportunity to do this comes at the very earliest stage of life shortly after fertilization when the seeds are ripening in the flower they react to environmental conditions if it is particularly warm and dry appropriate genes are activated Scientists have proven that under these conditions, spruce seedlings are better able to tolerate warm weather, though they lose the same measure in frost resistance. Mature trees can adapt as well. If spruce survive a dry period with little water, in the future they are markedly more economical with moisture and they don't suck it, up, suck it all up out of the ground right at the beginning of summer. The leaves and needles are the organs where most water is lost through transpiration. If the tree notices that water is in short supply and thirst is becoming a long-term problem, it puts on a thicker coat. The tree toughens up the protective waxy layer on the upper surfaces of its leaves. The walls of the cells within the leaves keep them watertight and the tree increases the thickness of the cell walls by adding extra layers. As the tree battens down the hatches, however, it also has a harder time breathing. Once a tree has exhausted its behavioral repertoire, genetics come into play. As I've just mentioned, it takes extreme, an extremely long time to produce a new generation of trees. This means speedy adaption is not an option, but other responses are available. In a forest that has been left to its own devices, the genetic makeup of each individual tree belonging to the same species is very different. This is in contrast to people who are genetically very similar. In evolutionary terms, you could say we are all related. <laughs> in contrast, the individual beaches growing in a stand near where I live are as far apart genetically as different species of animals. This means each tree has different characteristics. Some deal better with drought than cold. Others have powerful defenses against insects and yet others are perhaps particularly impervious to wet feet. If climatic conditions change, the first individuals to die will be those that have the hardest time dealing with the new status quo. A few tr old trees will die, but most of the rest of the forest will remain standing. If conditions become more e extreme, one tree species could even be decimated without this being the end of the forest. Usually, a sufficiently large number of trees remain to produce enough fruit and shade for the next generation. I made a calculation for the old beach stands in the forest I manage using available scientific data. Even if we were to have a Spanish-style climate here in Hummel sometime in the future, an overwhelming number of the trees would cope. The only proviso <laughs> is that the social structure of the forest is not disturbed by lumber operations so that the forest can continue to regulate its own microclimate for itself. That was like the shortest chapter. <laughs> and um, yeah, okay, I feel a little bit more settled. I think it's probably because... I wanted to um, like reach the round number um, or the, the, the whole the more whole complete number of 30 and not leave it at 29 and uh, I, feel, I feel much better about it <laughs> anyway so uh, see you soon and uh, yeah brace yourselves for the next one uh, it is going to be obviously chapter 31 and the title is possibly actually quite relevant um, and maybe something we can crack some meaning out of and get some insight into and it could be just very very applicable as well to our um, various current situations <laughs> and uh, yeah that's all to say the heading is turbulent times 
So yeah. Anyway, things are looking up, especially in terms of that chapter. And uh, yeah. Bye.